All right, we're live. Hey, everybody. Welcome, Welcome to another. To oh, I've got an echo here. Welcome to another episode of Wine for That Street. Today, we are very, very, very thankful to Carlo DeVito for coming back to us because earlier we did Baco Noir Part One, and it was an incredible episode. And technology defeated us, and it didn't record. <laughs> so, all that great lost, right? A first time ever. Yeah, so I'm taping it right now, so uh, you know audio. So if anything happens, hopefully we'll we'll just have audio. Sure. Well, that is what that second that echo was. Um, I was trying to record it in the background also, and apparently it was doing a double whammy there. So I shut mine off. So we're gonna rely on on webinar jam and Deb to uh, get this right because it was such an incredible episode and so interesting. So our guest is uh, Carlo DeVito. Uh, he is the former owner of Hudson Chatham Winery in New York and author of more than 20 books, which blows my mind. So welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. Oh, well, we appreciate it. And for those who do not know me, I am Lori Budd, your co-host. I am a WSET Level 2 graduate, Champagne Specialist, Cote de Rhone, and currently in week three of the Spanish Wine Scholar Guild's um, program and am remembering how difficult it is to study. <laughs> <laughs> I am also the co-owner with my husband of Dracina Wines and in Paso Robles and my co-host, Deb. I'm Debbie Giaquindo. I'm known as the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. I'm a certified specialist of wine, a wine location specialist in port and champagne, and a certified sherry wine specialist. I'm author of the book, Tapping the Hudson Valley, Day Trips and Weekend Itineraries to the Hudson Valley Wine Region. And I'm a partner in a restaurant in North Wildwood, New Jersey, a Trio North Wildwood, where it's ramping up. And that's going to be where I spend the next four months. <laughs> uh, yes. And I right beforehand, she was already on the phone taking reservations. So they're filling yeah. up. So. <laughs> so I think we are going to uh, let Elmo come in and to get rid of the technology um, voodoo thing, you know, I brought yeah. Elmo to this episode. So hopefully he brings us um, a little laughter and some okay. good, good <laughs> luck on this one. So why don't we start the video and then we'll let uh, okay. do a little intro of himself. And then most importantly, we'll be able to pour a little wine and enjoy. All right, here we go. I got it. So tonight, thanks to Debbie, I have another bottle. This is Hudson Chatham 2015 Reserve Baco Noir. Nice. Uh, from the Castle's Vineyard. Yes. So, Deb, are, are you drinking? You I've got, yeah, I've got a 2010 Baco. Wow. I Corvan these last time, so. And oh, I have nice. a Block 3 North Creek Vineyard. Ah, mm, one of my faves. All right. And, now, uh, I have a 2015 Middle Hope, which is a vineyard that no longer exists. Uh, and this is the one that got a 91 uh, in wine enthusiast. Very nice. So, Carla, can you give us a little background on yourself, a little brief introduction so people know a little bit more than my very, very brief introduction? And while you're doing that, I'm going to raise a glass, say slancha, and enjoy some Baco Noir. Cheers. Um, yes. Uh, um, so I was a, 
uh, a publish editor and a publisher uh, for more than 20 uh, years. And, um, and I worked uh, especially uh, in history, science, and then food, wine, beers, and spirits. So I've worked with Kevin Zraeli, uh, Oz uh, Clark, uh, Matt Kramer, Tom Stevenson, um, uh, did the New York Times Book of Wine. I shepherded the uh, Wine Spectator book program for many years. Uh, and then I owned uh, Hudson Chatham Winery. Uh, mostly I've been writing about whiskey recently, but my new book coming out in July is called Drink the Northeast. And it's about all the best wineries, distilleries, breweries, and cideries uh, nice. from Maine to Connecticut and Rhode Island. So that'll be out in July. That so, sounds like fantastic research to me. Yes. And, uh, and I've been most recently making wine at Unionville Vineyards in New Jersey for the last seven and a half months. All right. You get around. Yes, you around. do. Yes, you do. So I know from the last time we spoke that there's a dirty little word when it comes to Baco Noir called hybrid. But can you please explain what is meant by hybrid and why we're why it's kind of that dirty little word? Yeah, I got a, a hybrid um, is exactly what people think it is. The crossing of uh, two uh, genesis and um, and what happened was in the um, 1800s, there was a phylloxera epidemic in Europe. Uh, a little vine louse that would go into the dirt and eat the roots of the plants and kill off the plants. And for uh, many years, um, uh, growers uh, were hybridizing uh, classic vinifera grapes like Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Pinot Noir, uh, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, um, Chardonnay. And they were taking those uh, grapes and trying to crossbreed them with American rootstock, which were impervious to this little vine louse called phylloxera. Um, what the solution was in the end was they just took American rootstock, planted it, and then grafted uh, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon or Merlot or, or uh, Pinot Noir onto these plants. And that's how they saved winemaking in Europe. But in the meantime, you had this 60 year period where uh, all these different nurseries, uh, especially in Europe, were trying to develop this super plant to try to overcome phylloxera. And you had a lot of people come up with new grapes. That wasn't the only reason. A lot of uh, hybrid grapes, so-called, were uh, 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 hybridizers were creating them to grow in the soils or conditions where they were. So for example, if you had high alkaline soil, they were trying to breed a grape that would do well in a high alkaline soil, where they would do well, uh, where they would get wet feet. There were a number of different reasons, uh, but phylloxera was what originally really drove the, 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 the conversation. Here in the United States, um, uh, the, the uh, hybrids gained a huge, huge foothold through a man named Philip Wagner who owned uh, then Bordy Vineyards. And he was uh, even more famous because he was the editor of the Boston, I mean, of the uh, Baltimore Sun. He had succeeded H.L. Mencken as the uh, publisher of the uh, Baltimore Sun. He was the person who saved East Coast winemaking by introducing hybrids to begin with back in the 40s and 50s. And one of his big discoveries that he really made his name on was Baco Noir. Uh, Baco Noir was developed by Monsieur Baco, uh, Monsieur Baco and um, uh, it was actually Baco Noir number one. He got it right on the first try. He tried a number of others, didn't realize how good he had it uh, with number one. Uh, and um, uh, so he, uh, Philip Wagner really promoted a number of these hybrid grapes. Why were they so popular? Number one, they were cold resistant, so it could get cold as it did in the east, and the plants would survive the winter. They were also required a lot less uh, spraying and maintenance because uh, here in the east, we have a lot of humidity. Uh, we have a lot of other pressures that uh, they don't have in California. So you had to have a hardy plant that was going to survive these other conditions as well. And so Bacco Noir and another and a, a group of others became very, very uh, popular. They were easier to grow. They flourished here in the Northeast. Uh, the problem is that as the years went by, 
Dr. Frank introduced the um, ways to grow vinifera here on the East Coast. And uh, hybrids were used to make, I'm going to be blunt, crappy wines. You'd, you'd grow a lot of Baco Noir. You'd uh, uh, you would uh, uh, let it uh, ferment for you know, two, three weeks to get this big inky black uh, wine. And then you just throw a ton of sugar into it because it's got a lot of acidity. And, um, you know, you made popular sweet wines. And so hybrids got like a really dirty name uh, for that because they were just using rather low end techniques to make these wines. And so their, their reputation went that way. Uh, one of the people that I truly, truly believe has led a resurgence in that is uh, our own Steve Castles, who joined us. We bought our farm in January of 2006, planted our first grapes in 2006. And in the end of 2007 or beginning of 2008, we ripped out, I don't know, a third to half of all our grapes. And Steve replanted uh, everything with uh, two main grapes, uh, which were um, Baco Noir and something called Shell Wah. And he also brought back a number of other hybrids that really had been lost uh, to other people, including Verden and a number of others. So uh, we uh, had tremendous success with those wines. Why? Because we treated them like vinifera. Uh, we thinned fruit. We pulled leaves uh, in the cellar. Uh, we didn't overdo it. We really tried to make a nice, soft, approachable wine instead of trying to make this big, inky, dark thing that was going to keep up with in terms of looks with Napa, because it's not what you do uh, here anyway. And um, uh, we came up with some lovely sort of soft, approachable, you know, Pinot style, Ronish style reds that did incredibly well. And uh, we were the first winery to get a 90 or better uh, from wine enthusiasts for our Baco Noir. So that was the first time anybody had broken that uh, glass ceiling for a red hybrid wine. And we were very, very proud of that. And our wines were in all the top restaurants in Manhattan. Um, we were in Rouge Tomat. We were uh, in uh, Il Buco. We were in a number of, of big restaurants in the city. So it was a real big thrill. And uh, and we went on to get a lot of good scores and a lot of lovely reviews. And I'm really happy with that. And Steve has sort of led the charge since then with his book, um, and uh, there's just a lot going on now with hybrids. People say hybrids is like it's a dirty word. It's become synonymous with cheap, crappy wine. And what you see now are people taking these, these grapes and reinventing them in, in much more interesting ways, using modern techniques to make fine wine out of them. And there's a lot of really fantastic people uh, making great wines using what are hybrids. But, you know, I would just say they're interesting grapes. All right. and Interesting say, grapes. The Baco, I first got introduced to Baco from you and from Steve. And I had the uh, Middle Hope Vineyard. I think you have that, Lori, that mm -hmm. wine? I have the Cas I Cas Castles. Castles. Yes, she has the Castles Vineyard. I have, uh, yeah. I have the uh, Middle Hope. Oh, you have the Middle Hope. So you sent me, somehow I was at the, somebody sent me to the Middle Hope Vineyard. It might have even been you to pick something up. And Steve gifted me a bottle of, you know, Baco he was really, really proud of. And it was like six or seven years old. I'm like, this ages? Yeah. And I took it home. I had it and I was blown away. I was like, holy cow, really opened my eyes up to Baco, where before, honestly, I didn't have a good opinion of it. And yes, it was hybrid. So no, I'm not going to, you know, drink it. But I... You know, I really enjoy a Baco now, and it, it goes. Oh yeah, I mean, a good Baco well. can, can last quite a long time. It's got yeah. tremendous flavor. It's got. Well, really here I have one that's that's twelve years old. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's drinking very well. <laughs> so I mean, that's that's why they're kind of called the you know that that there's that dirty little uh, term uh, hybrid is because most people use it to their hybrids to make, you know, big sweet pink rosés or big, heavy, sweet reds or port, uh, they're not putting in the time to make a fine wine out of it. And when you do put in that effort, you really can extract a, an exceptional wine. And, and there's that, a lot of good people doing it, not just not just Steve, right. but Steve is now over at Malaya Vineyards, and right. uh, he's got his whole new line of heritage, uh, uh, Hudson Heritage grape, uh, uh, Hudson Heritage uh, 
series of wines uh, over there. So you can and get the that, that I think that's like a big thing across the whole like world, not even wine world, right? It's that first impression. And once somebody has that first impression, it takes so much more to break that first impression than, than if, you know, even if it's not their own first impression, right? They're reading somebody else's first impression or hearing somebody else's first impression. So, Well, I think the, the big new step is that in Bordeaux now, they've, uh, they've allowed for the first time, in I don't know how many generations, uh, the growth of uh, uh, a specified number of hybrid uh, grapes. It's the first wow. time in, in uh, literally generate. I mean, four or five generations. So it's a it's a really big big deal. So wasn't Baco produced over in France too? And then Baco they- was produced yeah. over in France, and uh, it was brought over. As I said, the person who really made it famous was. Um, Philip Wagner. And then uh, the next person who grew it to some uh, fame was Ben Marl Winery with yeah. Mark Miller. And Mark was a very good friend with uh, Philip Wagner. Philip Wagner, by the way, also wrote three winemaking books that uh, I mean are still in print today and have sold millions and millions of copies. So he really was one of the fathers of East Coast winemaking. Um, then um, as you and I were discussing, Debbie, uh, before the show began, the next big grower of Baco, uh, of quality Baco, uh, was uh, Girardet, which is a, um, a family of French descent uh, who live in Oregon. And Girardet Vineyards makes a Baco Noir that is absolutely stunning. So there's Baco on the West Coast, and Baco's grown all over. Baco's grown throughout New York State. Again, some of it goes into you know, blends of all different kinds and, 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 and uh, uh, ports and things like that. But if you go over into the um, Niagara Peninsula, uh, Henry of Pelham makes an absolutely stellar Baco Noir. There are a number of good Baco Noirs when you go over the uh, line there. And then, of course, um, uh, so th those, those are some of the ones that I, I, I really uh, uh, love. And then there are people who are making other quality hybrids uh, like uh, Victory View up in um, uh, above Albany was featured in the New York Times by Eric Asimov, and he's making stellar Marquettes. Um, you've got uh, Shelbourne who's making Marquette to a, just a tremendous uh, level in uh, Vermont. So there's a number of really good wines that are out there that are just really happening. And of course, you've got the La Garagista who's making all kinds of cool natural wines and they're using a lot of hybrids as well and they're found in the best stores and restaurants so there's there's a lot of quality stuff um coming around so it is a hybrid grape who are baco's parents oh uh gosh uh, you know i should have studied this before i came on uh alicante i believe was one of them if i'm not mistaken or is oh. that Shelwa? I forget because we Shelwa was another big uh, uh, grape that uh, he uh, that Steve brought back. Um, but the idea was that uh, you, when you make it, you can either Folle uh, Blanc. Oh yes, there's a Blanc in there. Yeah, uh, and Folle of course Blanc. Baco Blanc, which is a sister, uh, you know, which is a, another one of Baco's uh, grapes. Baco Blanc is one of the um, uh, 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 one of the grapes that goes into cognac, so it's, uh, it's very well grown in the cognac region. So yeah, so there you go. Little little fun fact. There so, you go. Mister Mister Baco did okay. So are the Baco vines phylloxera resistant? Yes, they are, um, and they don't grow like. Uh, vinifera. Uh, I think when we were chatting last time, I was uh, trying to explain when you when you grow vinifera, you've seen in, in these all these wonderful, beautiful vineyards, right? They they're able to cut out the fruit zone, and you see all this beautiful low hanging fruit, and then the shoots go up this way, and then they get trimmed, and it's all very beautiful. It's like topiary at the good at the good uh, uh, wineries. Baco is is got some got some river uh, rat in it, um, and so it just grows everywhere. It's just a giant explosion. Um, and I have to tell you, there was nothing better than seeing that when we first put it in because we had had some other grapes in there. I had tried to grow muscat, and it was just an absolute disaster. And um, 
and 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 Steve said, "No, no, we're going to rip all that out. We're going to put in Baco." And you know, you, when you're when you have an unhappy plant, you go out to the farm every day, out to the vineyard, and you know, you have these struggling plants, and you're like, "What are we doing wrong? Like, what is what is wrong with us? You know, what, uh, it's got to be our fault." And Steve put in Baco, and it was just, it, it, you know, it was like chia pets. I mean, the thing just took off. And <laughs> And um, I remember in our second year, we had to get a machete and chop through the the rows because they had literally just grown across from uh, each other. We had no idea the uh, strength of these vines. So you get leaders up to 20, 30 feet like nothing. So it's uh, it's a very vigorous plant in the right area. And it's a and they're very hardy. Um, we don't get a lot of winter dieback. Um, and, uh, you know, we did our best to try to control some of the fruit, remove uh, what we called Christmas berries. Uh, there was that fruit that we didn't think was going to be uh, ripe until Christmas. We take those down uh, so that the plant concentrates on the on the good fruit that we think is going to make harvest. Um, and um, and we discovered in our in our growing that there really were two kind of clones, if you will, not that they're officially recognized, but they're completely different grapes uh, or, 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 or uh, plants. Uh, the stuff that Steve had has in his vineyard and that we propagated at least half of in our vineyard uh, produces a beautiful bright red wine, um, almost like cherry juice, really, really pretty stuff. Um, we, Steve didn't have enough plants, so we called up several of the uh, nurseries in upstate New York, and we were able to buy enough to supplement a large block, the block three. So we planted Steve's stuff up high, and the um, and the uh, uh, the Finger Lake stuff uh, in the lower part of the block. And what we were realizing is that number one, the grapes at the bottom of the block gave off a much darker, darker fruit. Um, had a lot more sort of. Uh, dark cherry, maybe even a hint of blueberry to it. And the ones at the top were very bright red cherry. The stuff at the bottom actually was ready about seven to 10 days earlier than the stuff at the top. So, um, you know, there was no difference in the amount of sun each piece of that vineyard block got, but it was very clear that the ones at the bottom were matured first and were ready. And if you waited for the whole block, you were going to lose a lot of fruit down the bottom. So we had to make two, sometimes even three tries through the vineyard to, to get the fruit at the, at the exact right moment. And it's all something you learn when you're, when you have a vineyard. Yeah. The, the ones that were lower, were they more um, susceptible to frost? They uh, no, cause there was a still a lot of uh, grade left in okay. the hill after that. The only thing was the last row was, I don't know, maybe a, 50 to 100 yards from the nearest tree line. Not not even, I don't think. Uh, but that that last row is is always the toughest. But I think that's true in a lot of vineyards. I don't think that's a big deal. Um, but uh, as I said, we'd have to get after that, that those bottom 10 rows uh, much earlier than we could let the other ones uh, push on a little further. So I'm guessing it was kind of like a trial and error system to know exactly how much manipulation you know, to what, you know, how many leaf, le you know, layers it likes uh, to grow its best and how much green drop to do? Like, was it when he first got um, I don't know if it's trial and error, just a matter of getting at it, which is not always easy, okay. right? I mean, it's the middle of summer when you're at your busiest in the season in terms of the tasting room and festivals, etc. cetera. So, um, you know, it's just a manpower issue at that point. Do we have enough hands to go out there and do it? Um, you know, uh, pulling leaves on Baco is tough only because, as I said, Baco doesn't have that nice straight fruit zone. You've got to search out the the, the largest clusters and, and pull around those and then just keep, you know, sticking and moving, sticking and moving. Um, that takes a little bit of getting used to or trying to, like, understand how the patterns go and things like that. It's, it's not easy. Um, uh, the Christmas berries... That was, that was actually pretty easy. Matter of fact, several years, we actually made verju from it. We actually collected those berries, crushed them, and made a verju out of it. And we sold that to restaurants, and we sold it in our tasting room. It was great for mignonette and all that kind of stuff. So it was really, really uh, popular. We made a small amount of it, you know, like 
20, 30 cases. Uh, but that, that did very well for us. But it's just a matter of having enough hands to do that. And uh, that's that's always your biggest issue, especially, like I said, summertime. We've got so much going on, farmers markets, festivals, events. Um, you just hope you have enough hands to to get at it. That's, uh, you know, finding labor is always the most difficult part of owning a farm or a vineyard. Or a a business. <laughs> oh, my gosh. A business these days, finding yes, labor is very hard. Yes, it yeah. Is. Well, let's talk about let's talk about the wines a bit. So, I have, as I said, the 2015 Reserve, okay, mm -hmm. from uh, Castles Vineyard. Uh, so, can you first tell us a little bit about this vineyard site and like how it compares to? The oh yeah, other so we had three. Well, we we actually had five different bacos at one point because I'm insane. So uh, one of the things that we did have was. Uh, we had Castle's Vineyard. So that's Steve's personal uh, vineyard where he still lives. And at the time when we first started with Steve, I think those vines were 15 years old or some, something like that. He was already a local legend uh, up here in the Catskill region, uh, the local guy who made local wine. And uh, everybody went over his house for barbecues or, you know, traded for a bottle of wine, that kind of thing. Or, oh, I have one of those bottles. Did you did you get to taste it? That kind of thing. And um I met uh, him at a, uh, uh, he was a, he was in a amateur wine competition and um, it was, it was, um, uh, it was the Hudson Valley. Well, I think Debbie, were you involved in that one or you were just a guest at that one? With it the amateur 2006. One? It was the wine competition in 2006. The amateur one? Yeah. It was, it was all together. They were all together because it was held at uh, Stout Ridge. That was my first. That was your first one. My I first wine competition. I you. Yeah. So anyway, needle did I know I was going to be running it years later. <laughs> <laughs> so we, I met Steve then, and uh, of all the wines I tasted, professional and amateur, uh, uh, my two favorite, uh, three favorite wines were two by Steve and one uh, by the guy who now owns um, uh, uh, Paul Danino. Who owns? Uh -huh. uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the place. All Bashakil. That's it, Bashakil. So uh, those were my, my three favorite wines, and so I went to uh, Paul was already working on building his own winery, and I went to Steve and I said, "I I need a winemaker. Would you be interested?" And he goes, "Well, who'd be stupid enough to open up a winery?" I was like, "Right, right here." Um, <laughs> anyway, Steve was already making these wonderful wines, and so he he came and he taught us how to make these wines, and um, this. This vineyard is a lovely vineyard. It, it's a, it's all on a big, gentle slope. Uh, these vines are uh, in the back. He has about six acres. It's one of the most important experimental, privately owned experimental vineyards on the East Coast. And um, he's got hundreds and hundreds of different uh, grapes. I remember we were walking through the vineyard one year, and he turned around proudly and said, I have all the Massachusetts hybrids. And I went... Yeah, for all those who care. I don't know. <laughs> Go to the Baco. I want to see what the Baco is looking like. Um, and so um, the wines from there were always had a lovely, bright cherry uh, flavor to them. Uh, they had a much brighter red color. Uh, they were soft. They had a little bit more acidity, but they were also just beautiful. The, um, the Baco Noir Block 3, which is a blend of the um, uh, Finger Lakes and of the uh, uh, of the ones from Steve. The ones from Steve had come directly from Philip Wagner. These were um, and from Ben Marl. These were grapes that had these were vines that had been smuggled into the country from France by Philip Wagner and by Mark Miller. So these really came direct from France. Um, the stuff from the Finger Lakes, as I said, just is a little different. Has a lot of the same feel, grows the same way, etc. Looks the same, uh, but the berries are a little darker, a little heavier, and um, a little more dark cherry as opposed to light cherry. Uh, and so that was a that was a, a great win for us because we will marry the both of them together, and we got a really lovely complex wine. Uh, it was a full square acre of of Baco, and it, it did incredibly incredibly well for us. We had a third vineyard, which was uh, Pulteney Farm, which was out in the Finger Lakes. When we first started doing the wines with Steve, we couldn't keep them in stock. We'd make, I don't know, 60 cases, 100 cases, and they'd be sold out in four or five weeks. 
And so I had called up the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. They forwarded me to the, the Grape Growers Association. And um, they, I said, look, I need Baco. Do you know anybody who's willing to, I'm making, I'm willing to make a commitment. Do you have somebody who's growing Baco? And I got a call back literally within the day from the president uh, who said, um, I found you a block of Baco. It's 60 years old. Would you be interested? And I said, I'm coming up tomorrow. Uh, I toured the vineyard at 7 a.m. and I signed a five-year contract at 7.30. Now, isn't uh, that, that the wine that you made with the rocks? Well, we're going to get there. We're going to okay. get there. So, uh, so that was that was the uh, Baco uh, old vines. And that was from 60-year-old vines. And the funny part was they were 60 when we first leased the property. I think we actually ended up having them for almost 10 years. And our general manager, Brian Van Dusen, was halfway through. He was like, Carl, you keep saying the vines are 60 years old. We've been making this wine seven years. Like, <laughs> you're, not, you're, not keeping up. you're not doing the math. Um, <laughs> then we did um, uh, uh, Middle Hope. Uh, Steve had his childhood, uh, childhood. In high school, Steve planted his first vineyard in the back of his parents' house. He had let it go because he was married, living with his children and his wife up here in Catskill. And uh, we were desperate for Baco. And I said, dude, I'll put in the money. If you put in the work, let's go revive that vineyard. It's a half an, it's a half an acre. That's a lot of wine for a little place like us. And um, that's 35-year-old vines. So I'm down for that. And so it took uh, two years of, uh, you know, it had been overgrown by the trees and it had trees growing up in the, in the middle of the vineyard. Um, we had a guy named Ralph Cooley back then who went down with chainsaws and all that kind of good stuff. And we cleared it out, put a fence up the whole nine yards and we got the middle hope. And the middle hope was one of the first big scores that we got was with the middle hope, uh, the 90 uh, or 91 from wine enthusiasts. So that was a big one for us. And then we had the Baco Noir, old Fieldstone Baco Noir and the Fieldstone Baco Noir, the uh, uh, I had read about Randall Graham, who was one of my big heroes, and he was making cigar violant, and he was taking crushed gravel and putting it in his, his wine to add extra flavor and complexity to this wine. And I was like, that's freaking brilliant. So um, I came up with the idea that uh, we would take stones from our farm and put them in the old vines. Since the old vines weren't technically our grapes in terms of being uh, an estate grape, um, we, I figured, well, we'll take this. This, these are our estate rocks. We're going to put it in there. We're going to see if something good happens. So I, I made the first one. We had a tank. I filled the tank with the rocks. We poured in the old vines. The next morning, I ran down. Um, uh, pardon the, uh, the the visual, but I ran down in my underwear at like six o'clock in the morning, and I put the tap you know, and I'm like tasted the wine, and it was like somebody had gone to the bathroom in my wine, and I was just like, oh my god. And this was a Sunday morning because we had done it on a Saturday, and I came in, and and Dominique was like, so how was it? I said, oh no, nothing, no, nothing yet. I, I didn't want to tell her I just ruined seven thousand dollars worth of wine, so. Um, <laughs> Uh, I had to go to work the next day. And before I went to work, I went down again, tasted it. It was even worse. And I thought, oh, my gosh, what have I done with this with this wine? It got progressively worse. And I had to tell Dominique that this was a bust. And um, I put barrels in front of that tank, anything, just so I didn't have to look at it. And one day, Ralph, our, who was our farm manager at the time, came into me and he said, look, everybody else is afraid to talk to you about this. He goes, but we need that tank. And whatever the hell's in there, it's got to go. Either we'll put it in a blue barrel and you can play with it. We can make vinegar out of it. Or we'll just hook a hose up to it and we'll run it out and we'll write it off. Because if, if it sucks, let's we'll just get rid of it. And um, I said, OK, OK. So he said, I want you to taste it first because I don't want to put it in a barrel if I don't have to. Uh, he said, I'd rather just let it go. So I tasted it and I was like, it, it had turned in this weird six, eight week period. It had absolutely turned and it was everything I had hoped for. It was the, it was the farmyard without, if you'll pardon my expression, it was the farmyard without the chicken shit. It was, it was <laughs> that, it had that complexity that you were looking for. So I said, you know, screw this, let's get the bottling machine up. Let's put it in a bottle and get rid of it. You know, thank God, you know. And uh, I have to say, I gave full credit to Dominique. She took all the rocks that were in the tank. She rinsed them off, but she made a giant pile in the middle of our tasting room bar and put a couple of bottles uh, around it. And it sold like crazy. And uh, it was a huge hit. And so we had to do it every year. And the worst part was every year, 
it stank like hell the first <laughs> two or three weeks. And I would say, like, please, Lord, don't let this be the year it doesn't turn. Um, and, uh, and that was our Fieldstone Baco Noir. So we made five different uh, Bacos, and they were all – uh, our goal was either they were single vineyard or, or or they had something really special about them, and that was our that was our, really our goal. Well, that's pretty special. Yeah, let's, I mean, you know, again, we were trying to do real hardcore uh, boutique winemaking and and really trying to up the game of what people were doing, and and we did the same thing with uh, Shawa, which was another one of these grapes that Steve had brought back. I don't think there was any. I think there was only one other vineyard in the whole country or two two maybe that were growing Shawa when we brought it back. And again, we got rave reviews for that wine. Again, a beautiful cherry kind of finish. And um and those those two wines were gonna put us on the map. And we made them like I said, like fine wine. So that was our goal. Aged them in um um older oak, second and third year oak. Um and uh, you know just baby them just the same way you would a Pinot Noir or anything anything else. So did you do you like put on the same level Baco and Pino, not to compare the two, not to say, wow. you know, but you talk about Baco and you talk about Pino in the same sentence. It, um, uh, it depends on the kind of style you're making, in my opinion. Uh, some people still like to make big, heavy Bacos, and some of them are incredibly, incredibly good. Uh, we really concentrated on trying to make our Baco like Pino, so we didn't uh, we didn't let our fruit macerate on the skins for as long as other people do. I mean, okay. somewhere between five and seven days, we were usually off the skins. We were looking for a much lighter, brighter, softer, approachable red that we thought you could compare to a Pinot or a Rhone style red. Um, and I think we accomplished that. I'll, I'll never forget, we went to a Hudson Valley winemakers tasting. You're supposed to bring wines in, in process. And, um, they did a Baco round and there were a number of people who were making Baco and they got to, oh, it was a blind tasting. <laughs> we got to it and everybody gave us like a four or a five out of five. And we were, I was so proud because I knew it was ours. And um, this one fellow said, oh, I give it a zero. So the, the, the fellow who ran the, the tasting, uh, Mike Migliore said, well, you, you got to defend that score. Mm -hmm. And because uh, uh, everybody else gave it a great rating. And he said, well, to me, it didn't taste like Baco. So I said, well, what did you think it tasted like? He said, well, it tasted like a good Pinot Noir. And I went, that's okay, I'll take that. That's I'll, take that <laughs> I'll take that zero. So, and that's what we were trying to accomplish. That's really, and I think that's why so many people were shocked by what we were doing is because it, it, we weren't trying to make a big, ugly red. We were trying to make a really a high quality, you know, a lot of people compared it to like a light Barolo. And those were the, those were the kind of wines we were trying to aim for. Well, it's got that acidity to it. Right. It's got that great acidity, which is why the flavor lasts, which is why it sellers right. well. Um, it's a great food wine. I'll never forget the first time we made the first year we made Steve's wine. Dominique and I went out to dinner and we went to this little Italian restaurant that no longer is there in uh, Hudson, New York. And um, we went with another couple and I said, we knew the owners and I said, look, we're going to buy a bottle of wine, but I'll pay the corkage fee. We'd like to start off with our own wine. And they had these big, beautiful Riedel glasses. And so the waiter took it away, came back and he passed around the glasses and we all cheered and we took a sip and I called the waiter over. I said, oh, no, no, no. I, I wanted the, uh, our wine first. <laughs> I was like, this is, this is a really nice wine. And he goes, no, no, that, that is your wine. <laughs> 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 well, I had never tasted it in a nice glass. You know, you're working in a winery. You got little crappy glasses because if you break them and bust them, you don't want to even have to think about it. And uh, it was so funny. We had never actually tasted this wine in a, in a, in a really nice glass. And it was just, I, I mean, it was a shock to me. That's how uh, really thrilled we were with it. And, so a glass uh, and does make the difference. A glass does definitely make a yeah. difference. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, it was a big thrill. It was a big thrill. But yeah, that's uh, and that's what we were trying to accomplish. So what did you have for dinner that night with the Baco? What, what's I your feel, top pairings? Uh, no, no, I didn't have feel I had, I had pork. I had a uh, grilled chops, which is perfect for that. You know, it's uh, it's the same stuff you would pick out for a Rhone or a Pinot, uh, you know, white meats, uh, 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 poultry, 
uh, like chicken, fowl, any kind of fowl. Um, those are the things you're looking for. It's perfect with roast chicken. Um, again, anything you'd pair a pinot with, you'd, you'd, you'd look to do that with, at least with our bacos. So let's talk about the taste of a baco. What can people expect when they taste a baco? And then I'm going to ask you, with that being said, talk about the Oregon baco and how it differs differs from oh yeah that's a good point um well uh one of the things you really expect as a solid profile definer is that there's always a sour cherry element to it and it's not a we're not talking about you know uh we're not talking about gummy bears or anything like that we're talking about it's a lovely uh cherry flavor anything from a light bright cherry with a little hint of uh, sour which is that bright acidity that comes through on the wine um all the way up to a dark sour cherry with the uh, Baco Noir old vines. No matter what we did, uh, it came out almost uh, uh, as a as like a as a lovely sort of Italian style red. It just was this had this beautiful feeling to it. Um, and again, we didn't leave the the grapes on the skins for real long. We, we aged it in, in uh, older oak. Really got some really beautiful flavors going. So again, you're looking at Rhone. Maybe uh, some uh, you know lighter Italian style wines, uh, Nebbiolos, things like that, Dolcettos. Uh, that's the kind of feeling. If you're looking for similar uh, tasting patterns from what we were doing, that's that's where we were headed, and that's that's what you got with Baco Noir, for example. And that's what Henry Appellum was doing up in Canada, by the way, which was another place that we were really enamored of. Uh, ben Marl was still making Baco Noir back then, and theirs was more like our old vines because they had old vines. And so uh, I was always thrilled by that because I always loved the Ben Marl Baco. When you go out west, you've just got these big hot days that they have that we just don't have. And they have a bigger growing season. It's drier. Um, theirs is much darker, much darker, but the acidity falls off uh, for them. So the acidity is not as high as it is back out east. Um, one of the grapes that I would um, uh, use as an example is when you have uh, Save All Blanc is another, it's a white hybrid, very, very acidic. And if you pull it early, you can make great sparkling with it. Uh, you can make a Vino Verde or a Sauvignon Blanc style white. Uh, if you just press it and, and, and put it into stainless steel, it actually works really, really lovely. The more you try to chase the sugars on that, you're better off pulling it when it's at 18 bricks. If you uh, chase it to uh, like 21 bricks or 22 bricks, 24 bricks, the acidity just drops off the table. You get this flabby white wine. With the Baco on the, on the West Coast, um, that they, they chase that sugar, but the acidity falls off. And that's not a bad thing there because... There's still plenty of acidity to give it a nice, good feel, but it's not as dramatic as what uh, as what we have. So you get this big, soft, plush uh, red. Um, it's um, you know it's not as dark as a Cabernet Sauvignon, but it's certainly as dark as a Merlot. It's got this lovely, lovely color to it, beautiful dark red color to it, and it's just this big, soft, fruity mouthfeel. Lots of bright cherry and dark cherry all mingled in there, a little bit of bramble, which is also common to any Baco, East Coast or West Coast. It's a much different wine. It's a bigger wine. Um, uh, it's it's a California wine, if, I, if you know what I'm trying to say. It's got that big, deep color that I think a lot of consumers have become used to. Um, uh, but it's a, a fantastic wine. And uh, I brought a bottle over uh, to Steve the other night and um, – I should have saved it for this evening. I, I apologize. But uh, Steve loved it. You're like, oh, my God, this is fantastic. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, Mark Girardet is the owner of Girardet Vineyards, and he does a spectacular job with uh, Baco Noir out there. And there are some other um, producers in Oregon and, and maybe a few in Washington. I know there are some others in uh, Oregon who are also making um, uh, Baco Noir. And so that's, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big grape out there. Are we seeing any Baco coming from like the old world still? Is there, you know? Oh, you know, that's a good question. Um, I know in England they do a number of hybrids, and I know Baco and, and Foch and a couple of those other, Save All Blanc, are all grown uh, throughout um, England. Um, 
I'm not sure where else Baco is being grown. I mean, uh, there's still some being grown in France. It's usually outside the main growing regions. So uh, they might have it in Languedoc, but more often than not, the, these big regions are either growing what they need for Champagne or Burgundy or uh, Bordeaux. All have their specific grapes. They're locked in, right. so to speak. Uh, but there are a number of... Um, uh, farmers who grow Baco Noir outside of those regions, yes. Some of it's oh. just for private use. And, and, I was going to say it could just be Yeah, and there little... are number, you know, it's funny, uh, we don't even think of it, but I, I remember I was uh, driving around France with Dominique, we were in um, Jurançon, which is a lovely little area, and they were growing grapes, they were growing all kinds of grapes, so, you know, and they were making blends. The French are much more interested in, like, whatever they grow, they're going to put it in the pot, and they're going to make a, a, you know, a house blend. And so I know there were some uh, vineyards that were growing uh, Baco down in that region, but of course it just gets put into a, a blend, which is their tradition over there. At so least I'm, it was at the time. I'm thinking you you brought up England and it growing there, um, and you know England is now you know becoming a place known for sparkling wines because you know because of the climate change and all of this. So how do you see, you know, the fact that Baco was actually created, bred to be cold, you know, cold tolerant, where do you see the future, hap you know, what's happening to Baco now that these temperatures are changing? Well, I mean, I could tell you that a number of wineries have come uh, came to us uh, when, when when I was there at Hudson Chatham, uh, and uh, have come to see Steve since, who are looking for uh, new grapes, new flavor profiles to uh, widen their portfolio and, and bring something different to the marketplace. And he's been selling uh, vines because he has his own nursery to a number of different wineries, including the West Coast. Uh, but you're seeing now that more people are understanding that. You can make fine wines out of, uh, of uh, uh, hybrids, and you're seeing new hybrids. For example, uh, Marquette, uh, the, the the Minnesota hybrids like Marquette and Frontenac and Frontenac Gris and La Crescent. Um, these are um, grapes that uh, uh, are building um, uh, followings, and so uh, you're starting to see. Between the hybrids and the and the mark and the uh, Minnesota hybrids, you're seeing vineyards pop up in places you weren't finding them before. I mean, if you go above Albany in New York State, 10, 15 years ago, there were maybe two, three, four, five vineyards up there. Now there's an entire uh, wine trail up there, complete with about 15 or 16 wineries. Uh, they're growing grapes in a lot of other places that they didn't before. You're seeing huge amounts of grapes being grown now. Oh, I say huge. You're seeing a lot more grapes being grown. in. Uh, I was just in New Hampshire uh, over the past weekend um, where I was at a place where they were growing Baco Noir and Deshaunac and a whole bunch of other, uh, a combination of the two different hybrids. Um, Vermont, New Hampshire are... Uh, Massachusetts, they're all growing uh, a lot. They're, they're less afraid of growing uh, hybrids now that better wines are, are out there. And it's been a younger customer who has embraced these wines. People who were in their 40s and 50s, especially when we started, they were like, Baco? Yeah, well, I'll try the Baco. <laughs> and, um, uh, and we noticed immediately there were two levels of customers. There were people in the 40s and older, and they read wine enthusiasts, and they read wine spectator. They wanted to know, did we have any scores? You know, did, did uh, you know, uh, Frank Pryall or, or, or Eric Asimov write about it? They have very specific uh, places they went for information about wine. Uh, we saw with younger clients, people who were like, say, 21 to 35, 40, were much more open to try new wines. Um, you know, a lot of Cabernet Sauvignons have been priced out of the market for them. And they were trying to find that thing that they could call their own. P really good Pinot Noirs were also very expensive. So they were looking for something new, something different. And uh, we were very fortunate. We had a lot of people like uh, the Edible Man, uh, the Edible uh, Communities magazines wrote a lot about us. Uh, a lot of the bloggers like Len Thompson and, and a number of other uh, folks have written about us. Um, uh, you know, we've had 
uh, so many people. Uh, Debbie wrote about us. Uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get killed because there's 50 people um, uh, who who have written about us that were so so lovely. Um, and um, like Susan Gordon from Forbes and uh, 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 Kathleen Wilcox and Shreves. And, I mean, there's, there's just a whole bunch of lovely people who've written about us, and I I couldn't be more grateful and thankful to them. I'm gonna get shot by a bunch of twenty people that I failed to mention. Amy, Amy Zavato. I mean, I'm gonna stop. I gotta stop. But uh, Chris, uh, Chris uh, what's his name? So uh, uh, it's been a huge thrill in that way. And what happened was those younger customers were much more interested in the stories and stories about how we were making our wines and what we were doing. And they were much more open to, to uh, trying our wines, but I, I was really proud that we, we were able to get a good, good portion of each of those groups. We had a nice mix uh, between them. So uh, it took a while, but it takes a while for anybody who's trying to make quality wine to, you know, really get that going. Absolutely. Should we talk about what's in our glasses? Yes. Okay. So I don't know if you can answer this off of the top of your head. How? But do you know how many cases about you produced of this? The which one the is reserve? that one? This is the 2015 reserve. From okay. Cal so uh, in a good year, we would produce maybe 75 to 100 cases, maybe. Okay. More often than not, it was 50 cases. Uh, uh, but in a good year, we might get to 75 to 100. So um, he had a lot, uh, at one point, he had a lot of uh, bird penetration, uh, turkeys, oh. hawks. Uh, he was attacked by a hawk once. That was always a good story. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, he brought a tennis racket out and and, a, and an umbrella. That was quite cool. was <laughs> that, The visual of him I wish I had that on him, video. With an umbrella and a tennis racket is just way too much. Um, but uh, uh, so it, it varied. I think only one year we got 100 cases. The rest of it was... 50 to 75. So it was very small production stuff. Um, on the other hand, uh, old vines. Oh my gosh, goodness. We'd get um, uh, about a thousand to 1500 gallons. So you're talking, we would do 225 right. to 300 cases of uh, Baco Noir old vines. That was our big workhorse. Um, Middle Hope was 50 cases, 60 cases tops. That's a good year. Uh, regular year was probably a barrel, barrel and a half. That was very small production, but it was such quality that we didn't care. Um, and then our block three was probably 150 cases, maybe 200 in a good year. So um, those were the thing. Those were the the kind of numbers we were we were dealing with. So a couple of them were really, really small. But uh, between the block three and the old vines, we, you know, you, we would get up to around 600 cases or around there. Okay. So this, um, th this, I don't know if you can tell, I think this is starting to, it's got a little brick on the edges, um, mm -hmm. but it's a 2015. Um, and then I have to ask, and I don't mean pot, not, not a negative, negative positive. Was it hand bottled? It, oh, everything was handballed. There was nothing. Okay. That was, we, we had no machines. Because <laughs> I, I, you know, I took the capsule off and I looked at the cork, and you can see, you could, the, you know, it didn't penetrate, the, but you can see the. Yeah, was, uh, that was a mistake, unfortunately, yeah. but it became a kind of calling it. card for us. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. you get uh, that only when uh, you're doing uh, that. The thung, the thung. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know? and then the final, Eventually, we got. It was very funny because everything was hand corked up uh, for the first six or seven years. And, um, you know, you had to stand there just ka-chunking yeah. this thing oh. all day. And everybody would say, oh, no, Carlo, you're, you're, the, you're the best corker. You you keep doing it. <laughs> and as soon as we got a, a semi-automatic corking machine, all you do was push a button. Everybody wanted to <laughs> cork. <after that. laughs> it's a lot of work, and it's hard yeah, on the shoulders. Yeah, I was walking around like, you know, I was, I was looking like a hunchback in Notre Dame. I had like this big... <laughs> Shoulder and right arm, and they're walking around like that. You, you were uh, Popeye on one eye, one side Popeye. after no he after he had the spinach, right? <laughs> but it was, uh, yeah. So the first, the first uh, five to seven years, it was all hand cork, and then we we did get a, a semi-automatic corker, and that made a big big difference because right. so we were able to up our numbers. On this, um, I'm getting. 
the the acidity is definitely still there and that sour cherry is there but it's almost like a candied um cherry yeah there's a little bit of candy and there should be a little bit of bramble in there yep and, um, yep the the bramble the bramble is on the nose uh it's it's um you know earthy floor on the palate um yeah it's definitely how you had described it it's uh -huh. it is all there the and it's meant to be a food and wine like that was really our our goal all along was to make you know, uh, I remember when I first got there and I talked to Steve, I said, oh, I'm going to find a way to make, we'll blend all these hybrids. We'll make a big California style Cabernet Sauvignon. He's like, no, that's not what we're going to do at all. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to make soft approachable reds. And I was like, soft approachable reds? What the hell is that? And uh, he was absolutely right. There's no question about it. He was, he was absolutely right. He was fantastic. Well, I'll tell you, I opened the 2010 Baca Reserve just to show how, how well Abaco ages. And like I said last time, I, I was blown away. I am blown away on how well it ages. This is smooth. It's elegant. Mm. It's got Bing cherry in it, raspberry. It, it's got a hint of the little sour sourness. And I'm just, I, I think I, actually this one is probably at its peak. At its peak. Yeah, yes. I would think so. Definitely think at so. its peak. Um, and then the block three is 2016. And, and, and that one fruit is, should it, be a lot, lot fresher, right? Yeah, it is a lot fresher. But once again, the whole Baco, it's smooth. It's, it's elegant. I don't, you know, I don't see how anybody cannot like it. You, you know what I mean? I, it's just, it's not, it's like in, I think the old thought process of hybrid was yes um dirty and rough yes right. you know and this this one this is, is not <laughs> raspberry this has a little baking spice in it i mean it's really beautiful and in our pre-recorded episode that didn't make it um i had opened um a ben Morrow 2016 oh, baco during the episode and i i have i'm looking at my notes here and I wrote that it was a little bit more acidic and, um, mm -hmm. and the acidity was popping throughout the entire wine. Huh. So I, and, I, I, that wine made me fall in love with Baco Noir. There was no mm -hmm. uh, question about it. And then meeting Steve, of course, who started out at Ben Marl uh, making wines. And I, I did find, uh, I posted it at one point or another. He was on the uh, front page of the living section of the New York Times as wow. a, that as a 16 year old uh, walking around with grapes, he had the most foul look on his face. He was so <laughs> upset. And, uh, and he looked, and it's so funny because when I saw it, his kids were the same age as he was in the photo. And oh my God, the, your kids are exactly you. It's just great. <laughs> it was very funny. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that was the beauty of Steve. Like he learned to make Bach on Noir. Uh, by the time we met him, he'd been making Bach on Noir for a good 20 years uh, by the time we had met him. And he'd really, uh, perfected his his ideas on on how to do that, and, and we were really lucky. We were just in the right place at the right time. And then we took what he showed us, and we we made a few improvements here and there between Brian and I, and and it all worked out. It was a great team, great team uh, effort. You guys showed me my how I got the appreciation for Baco. To be honest, oh, well, with you. thank you, thank you very much. It's it's been uh, fun. I'll never get. Um, I went one time, I was in Niagara and I was, I was, I was tasting around. And I said, do you have a Baco Noir at this one restaurant, uh, a winery? And the guy said, Baco Noir, that's like a gorilla in a tuxedo. And I was like, okay, so you're a jerk. You have no idea what you're talking about, but okay, fine, you know. Um, but um, uh, the uh, the Middle Hope, uh, just to uh, chime in, has a lot of that big cherry. I mean, that's the beautiful side of Baco that when you have one of those bright ones, it's got that bright sour cherry. And mm -hmm. this this uh, Middle Hope is just spectacular. It's really beautiful. It's got that bramble, but it's also got that bright fruit and uh, the, that acidity. It's just bringing it along. Still a great wine. And this is a 2015, could easily go another couple of years. So really thrilled with that. Now, yeah. now I need a pork chop. <laughs> come to the restaurant i can help you with that there you go there you go well most of my stuff's in storage but hopefully this uh, summer i'll get it out and start uh, bringing around the wines again that'll be fun so we're coming up to nine o'clock here 
And if you want people the, you know, five top things that you want people to take away about Baca Noir. Ooh, uh, number one, if you like good wine, you're going to love Baco Noir. You just have to go to the right uh, places. Uh, there are some places that are making really great Baco Noir. Again, I uh, can't stress it enough. You can find Steve Castle's wines over at uh, Malaya Vineyards. Mark Girardet over in Oregon are making fabulous, fabulous uh, Baco Noirs. Henry of Pelham uh, in, in the uh, Niagara Peninsula is making fantastic Baco Noirs. There are several others. I'm just not remembering them all off my hand. And again, Oregon, there are some other lovely uh, Baco Noirs. Uh, Adirondack uh, Vineyards makes it actually a very good Baco Noir. And another good Baco Noir is um, Warwick Valley uh, Winery. Uh, okay. Their uh, Black Dirt uh, uh, wine is a, their Black Dirt Red is a Baco Noir. And it's a lovely, bright, fresh uh, red wine. It's uh, one of their best sellers, and it, and it's, it lasts in the bottle. Uh, it's not meant to be. Um, uh, it's just a, it's a great wine. You could either have it as a picnic wine with pizza and burgers, or you can go better with it. And it's a, it's a wonderful wine. So there's a lot of other uh, good people making those uh, wines out there. I think that's the first thing uh, is that those the, recognize some of the people that are out there doing that. Um, the other side is that uh, don't be afraid of hybrids. Um, yeah, there are some people out there doing some uh, really bad things with hybrids. Sorry about that. But uh, then again, I know there are some people doing that with, you know, white. Anything. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, um, so uh, there are, there are just some spectacular hybrids going around right now. And um, I, I think, You've got to stop thinking about hybrid as a dirty word. It's uh, it's we've got to really get beyond that. Um, I'm, I, as a as a manufacturer or a producer, I should say, we um, I was always like horrified. You know, they'd go to like Hungary, and here's the great new grape from Hungary, and I was just like, we have all these great new grapes here in the United States, and they're really, all anybody wants to talk about are the big six. So uh, uh, there's so much going on with these grapes that you really want to do that. The other thing is. One thing about hybrids that I have to stress too, uh, Baco Noir being chief among them, is they don't require as much maintenance. They don't require as much spraying, which was another reason we wanted to grow these grapes. We had our family and our dogs living on this property, and anything that, that required less uh, material needing to be sprayed on these vines to make them live uh, was uh, all the better because uh, we, we wanted to think about that first. And uh, that was another big reason uh, why we grew grapes. We uh, lessened our carbon footprint and we uh, lessened the amount of material that we were putting into the uh, into the atmosphere. And that was a really big issue for us. So those are some of the things that I would say. And and some of these wines can last a really long time. I mean, I, I, I somebody called me and said, I got Baco Noirs from 10 years ago. I'm like, Okay, you saved them. Okay, it's now the time to start drinking. But uh, but they do last. You know, they're not just uh, they're not just you know open it up and, and guzzle it. There there's some really fine lines out there. They can be laid down, and, and you can get some great stuff out there. So there's a, there's a lot of good things going on. And uh, uh, don't be afraid to try some of these new grapes: Marquette, Chalois, Baco Noir. Uh, these these uh, grapes they're making some great great wines, and you, you got to check them out. Thank you. And it, can people find you on social media? How can they, you know? No, I'm unavoidable, I think. You are. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I have a blog, which I need to get back to. I've been writing too many books uh, called East Coast Wineries. Uh, I just recently won, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, some award for uh, from the from the Eastern Seaboard uh, folks, fine folks of the Eastern Seaboard, uh, Grant Crandall, uh, for my contributions for writing about East Coast wines. Oh, congratulations. Uh, the, yeah. Thank you. And uh, I also did the Great American Winery Stroop Waffle, which some new episodes will be coming out shortly, So, uh, which is my video series on YouTube. So uh, you can find me anywhere. You can email me. Um, I'm a pretty easy guy to get a hold of. Awesome. Well, thank you, Carla, so much for doing take two on Baco. Hopefully this one will record. I could do that. I could do this part in my sleep. <laughs> Guys, well, thank we... you so much for having me and letting me do it again.
Yeah. Well, we oh, appreciate it. We understand how busy you are. So we appreciate you taking the time to do it again. And the fact that you are so knowledgeable in it to share with our listeners, we are very, very grateful. Thank you. Thank okay, you very now much. That wraps it up. Yeah. So right. I will raise a glass. Mm -hmm. yeah. Elmo will Elmo will say thank you also. Thank you. So slancha. Cheers. Slancha. Cheers. Have a good Cheers. one. Cheers. That was Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to end it. That, that is a great. Way. <laughs> Have a good one, everyone. Guys, thank you, you so much. Really Alrighty. appreciate it. Have a great one. Thanks okay. for having me again. Really appreciate it. All right. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.